Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod. We have Radko Ivanovic with us today. He's uh, the founder of two agencies, Zeal Agency and Snipers.Sell. We're going to talk about sales today, um, ICP, about pain points, about cold emails, outreach, SDRing, and finding product market fit, I guess. This podcast is brought to you by podpire.com. If you want to start your own podcast, if you want to scale it, go to podpire.com. That go. Cool. Welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Uh, so at the moment, I'm trying to scale both of my agencies. Uh, they're both business support. Uh, they're a bit different, although there's some, let's say, relation between them. One is focused more on supporting sales teams. The other is focused more on supporting general businesses, especially departments, et cetera. And at the moment, I'm quite fresh with snipers.sale. It's a one-year-old agency, one to one and a half. Although let's say product-wise, I would say the last six months to a year, something like that. So at the moment with both, I'm more in a mode where we're trying to chase more clients. Uh, increase our client base and slowly trying to see where our services would be shaped within the next, let's say, year or two. We're more of a traditional agency, let's say, but we try to use as much tech as possible. Interesting. Why did you start your own agencies? What's your story? So in terms of my story, uh, I'm actually a college dropout. Uh, my college years are frozen at the moment. I have a few uh, tests to finish plus the final thesis. Uh, but I started working as a freelancer a while back. I have a bit of a background in programming. Uh, and I started working as a freelancer on the regular platforms like Upwork or free freelancer.com, etc. A while back, it was, I think, 10 years ago. So I started a general like regular stuff, I would say. And after a bit, I saw a big gap in terms of just freelancers in general. Like, for example, when I compare the US, the US is quite ahead of everyone else. But in terms of Western Europe, the Middle East, etc., I saw there were a lot of demand for that type of hire, let's say. Uh, so I started working with a small freelancer team, just handling projects, but it was more like diverse in terms of I was a freelancer and I managed to create a freelancing team and we were both working on the project, but everyone was paid separately. So at the time I decided to, why don't I just start a company that provides VA services or virtual assistant services and slowly started building clients plus building up my team. I still use freelancers. I use them today as well because the general model fits me as well as other companies. And through that, let's say journey, I simply shaped different services that I would offer over time. So I started shaping the general virtual assistant approach. We have a different methodology that we work on. And I started offering automation services, uh, a bit of scraping or market intelligence in terms of lead generation, et cetera and a bit of data insights in terms of just tracking the sales funnel and marketing funnel. And I decided to form snipers.sale uh, because it generally uses a similar operations part of Zeal agency that focuses on lead generation or lead sourcing to be a bit more specific. Uh, but I partnered with a person from Switzerland who's doing sales consulting and is a negotiation trainer. So basically I packaged my services to his split them out of zeal and decided to go the route of, okay, let's use these ones to just support sales agencies because they're a bit more thematic, let's say. Within zeal, we generally, you know, you have a whole area of different services and then you offer them to different clients. Here, we want to zoom in on to the companies that actually do proactive sales and let's see how we can help them there. Interesting. So, What's your split of time between Zeal and Snipers? Uh, so today, I would say around 70% goes to Zeal, 30% goes to Snipers. Who are you targeting with each? Like, what's your precise ICP? Uh, so with Zeal, it's not that precise, I would say, because we're 
it depends on a service base level and I don't want to go too deep that part but I would say uh small to medium sized enterprises we generally avoid the solopreneur bunches they're generally in the growth stage of their company and they're generally in terms of industry we serve a bunch of different industries but we focus on generally SaaS companies investors in the space and other type of companies that do a lot of their work online either they sell online or they find clients online etc and in terms of the employee size it's around i would say 40 to 100 people we've done work with more but i think that's the sweet spot and we focus on regions such as western europe mina and that's about it with sniper sales we have a bit more specific icp uh, we target sales departments which have at least three to four people with a maximum i would say 10 and they do a uh, cold outbound and they generally work in uh, companies that have a shorter uh, sales cycle up to one to two months i would say Right. Tell me about your outbound systems. What technology do you use? What kind of copywriting do you go after? Any specific approaches that you're using that works super well nowadays? So we utilize ChatGPT a lot, actually. And we try to automate a lot of the parts of copywriting to personalize the message. We still need, need to edit a bit, so we're a bit picky there. In terms of the systems, uh, there's a few different parts of the system. There's the cold sourcing, there's the lead enrichment, and there's the outbound mechanism. For outbound, uh, for us, what works well is multi-channel combined with email and LinkedIn. We've been testing a bit uh, postcards as well, although we only have, and I think this is the Zoom <laughs> feature of balloons. Uh, we did a few tests with that, but we don't employ it on a daily basis. And we do generally sequences of around six to eight touch points, uh, switching between email and LinkedIn. And usually it goes from LinkedIn to email, sorry, from email to LinkedIn back to email. Unless someone actually engaged first on LinkedIn, then we do the vice versa route. Uh, we've used different tools. Uh, we use, at the moment, Outplay HQ, uh, which does both email and LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a bit more manual. They do it semi-automatically. But we also use uh, tools like Phantom Buster to do the LinkedIn outreach automated. It requires a bit of tweaking. And what we've done, and I would say it's a bit fresh, it's in the last two, three months, we started using uh, ChatGPT, but more so the OpenAI API to personalize bits and pieces of each message. Uh, what I realized that, and I haven't tested Claude, I heard Claude is much better for copywriting, but what I realized, if you give it too much space, it's, it's a mess and you need to edit each bit. But if you try to focus on one sentence, uh, and you play around with like two, three hours of a good prompt, you can personalize a message in a really well fashion and you can run like thousands of contacts through it. Are you using apps like Play to write these campaigns at scale or what are you using to GPTize at scale? Uh, actually, we're using a bit Homeburn. Let's say we're using a combination of Sheets, Make.com and ChatGPT. We haven't used like a copywriting tool. So we're doing it a bit more manual, let's say. Right. And what are examples of copies uh, that you can share that have worked very fine with your prospects? Is it short ones? Is it long one? Is it addressing the pain points? Is it interrupting pattern? What are you going for nowadays? Uh, nowadays, short. Uh, really short, especially because... Either with Zeal, we uh, offer too many services and it's harder to always pinpoint the one that's good for them. Uh, so we try to see the engagement, what parts uh, basically they clicked on. We try to put two, three links there as well sometimes just to get an idea of where they fit to. Uh, and in most cases, it's addressing the pain points. The Google uh, spam top down that happened like two and a half months ago. Have you seen your open rates go down? Like what's your tip to keep 
deliverability up, open rates up, and make sure that you don't fall in this spam? Uh, yes, but in terms of open rates, we saw a dip when they launched it. I was aware of it a while back. Uh, I was aware that something like this would happen because Google in the last two or three years started focusing on hitting spam a lot. Like three years ago, you can just do like yet another mail merge, for example, like the basic model and send up to 1K or 1.5K emails in one go. Nowadays, if you try to do it, you're going to get an account suspended after 150 to 200, maybe even more after the final update. We have saw it dip a bit. Uh, we've used an email warmer as well, especially for campaigns that are a bit fresh, uh, where we're offering something that's not easily recognizable by the audience. Uh, and we've generally, in terms of span, I checked the our uh, warm-up tool and we saw a bit of a spam rate increase when they launched it. I think they launched it bit by bit, so they didn't just put a stop and launch it all the way. Uh, what would be my suggestions? Uh, in general, to focus that the list that you have is really good to minimize the number of bounces. Uh, spread across the sends across the whole day and try to focus not sending that much same messages in terms of that the copy is exactly the same. The more you have it personalized, uh, the more bits and pieces that you have personalized, less chances that you get a spam report. And generally just focus on the GDPR or can, a, can spam act, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you do see a dip and, or you see if you have a tool that reports spam or something similar, I would generally ease out on the sense, but not stop them immediately. Because if you stop them immediately, when you start building them up, you'll go to the same situation. Maybe just uh, decrease them a bit, uh, rework what you're doing, see the reports in terms of how many bounces you have uh, or what types of message you're sending out, et cetera. The niches you're sending to nowadays, are you seeing some specific offers that work with some specific niche? Where are you seeing product market fit? Uh, for us specifically, mm, investors, but it's specific to our product because we do a lot of startup sourcing as well. And we're focusing a lot on investors and accelerators. And with them, we also offer a lot of automation services and something I've seen in the whole investor niche, they're trying to streamline, streamline their process a lot. Aside of that, I saw a bit of a dip in terms of SaaS. We did a campaign something like a year, year and a half ago that ran for two or three months. It worked well with SaaS. When we started it again this year, there's a bit of a dip there. So not sure if I answered your question. Why, why do you feel there's a dip? I have a sense they've... Uh, Part of it is the services that we offer, especially lead sourcing. There's a lot more tools on the market nowadays. You have Apollo, you have similar things to Apollo. If you do a simple Google search for leads, you're going to get a bunch of tools. And we do a bit of a tailor-made approach there. So it's hard to differentiate between ours and someone else's. Plus ours can be more expensive. Uh, that's one part of it. The other part is I have a feeling they, they get spammed a lot, more and more as each year passes. And I'm not sure. I know that every ISP or Google or whoever is trying to fight spam, but I have a sense that it's still being delivered more and more. Tell me about the approach to investors. So you reach out to investors to help their startups, right? Uh, yes, sometimes. More so, we try to uh, help them with deal flow sourcing. So in general, investors, especially those that are similar to accelerators, which run programs, and each program is similar. Basically, you want as many startups to apply to a program. You run it for the applications for one to two months. And in general, you just want to fill out your pipeline with quality startups. Most of them have a good grasp on the market. Most of them use a lot of startup databases, but neither of them is perfect, especially if you're working on a niche. If you're working on a niche, it's hard to get all the startups out there. Plus, especially those that are early stage, early, early stage. The ones that are series A, B, it's easy to find them. You're going to find them online. 
Yeah. And in general, we'll help them fill out their deal flow. That's one of the service. We offer them to support their startups. Uh, a lot of them have their perks or companies they partner with or something similar. Uh, and the third part is we try to help with their operations. Uh, a lot of these investors are really small. And I'm not talking about Y Combinator or something similar. A lot of them have like four to five people and they do a lot of their work themselves. What's your tab when it comes to uh, these incubators or these startup studios? How big is your market? Uh, so for the incubators and accelerators, let's say, uh, the market size is, I would say, somewhere around 10 to 15,000 of them globally. If we're talking about the wider market, if we're talking about a smaller market, which means that they're established, they exist year on year, we're talking about five, 6,000. In terms of investors investing in startups, I would say up to 30,000 at most. So, okay, incubators plus startup studios are around 15,000, both of them together? I would say, yes. Okay. That's quite interesting. Uh, U.S. only or world, worldwide? I'm going to tell you honestly, U.S. is like 80, 90 percent of them, <laughs> uh, but worldwide, worldwide. It's harder to find them when you're going towards emerging markets, especially those that are a bit less visible. Uh, but the good part of the emerging markets, there's still, I wouldn't say a lot of them. U.S. has a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them are in Europe, like UK or Berlin or something similar, but there's a lot of them that have a global reach and focus on emerging markets as well. Right. My feedback has been that investors or these folks, they're more interested in uh, raising capital than uh, finding the right startups. Fe feels that they always are full when it comes to having startups applied to them. Have you checked the aspect of helping them raise capital? Uh, that's one aspect that I haven't touched with them at all. We do also source, especially for accelerators. We also do source startups, uh, but we source other investors, other inc incubators, etc., and uh, ecosystem enabling companies, plus sometimes uh, development agencies, like bigger development agencies. But you're spot on with one point. We generally try to avoid the local ones that have that focus like startups in one country. They generally have a good visibility, plus they're prominent on the market. What are your top goals with uh, snipers this year? Uh, oh, that's a good question. One of my goal is with the lead sourcing aspect, I think we have a limit. Because a lot of the tools year on year have been getting better and better. And something like a tailor-made sourcing will always work, but it will become smaller and smaller. I want to see what our limits there are, and I want to shape it into a different product. So my goal is first to identify how far we can take it to get a bit more clarity on our market plus our services. And the other goal is we want to start offering negotiation as a service, negotiation training as a service, and create a community around it and focus more in terms of trying to be a bit more productized, let's say. What do you For mean the negotiation as a service? Negotiation training as a service. <laughs> uh, so the way we operate there is my partner is a negotiation trainer and he does packages for somewhat larger companies. Uh, actually larger sales teams, up to sales, uh, 10 salespeople, let's say. And it's more like either it's on-premise or it's live, and he does the full course for them. He structures it, personalizes it, et cetera. That's a nice approach. The margins are good. It's all fine. But we want to productize it a bit. Uh, one thing that I haven't we haven't seen a lot is people having the ability to spar with other people in terms of negotiation. You can get them. There are courses that have it, but... Not many of them, plus it's not developed enough. So one thing that we want to offer, we want to offer people the ability to spar with anyone else within their niche, within their profile, something similar. And one idea that we want to do is have it run to ChatGPT because you can create a sparring bot with ChatGPT, 
but have a way to spar with other people and try to game gamify it a bit. Have like leagues with scoreboards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And within that, we're gonna offer the course to them in terms of trying to train them, etc. Plus upsell to one-on-one -on -one sessions, coaching sessions. Very cool. And uh, yeah, the agency itself, like how many clients right now, by the end of the year, how much clients you want to run on? Uh, I would say recurring month over month, because we have a lot of smaller ones that hit and run, basically. Uh, I would say a goal is 20. That's pretty good. And what's your business model? Do you charge them like 2K per month or... Similar. We don't go below 1K. Um, there are projects where it could be make sense, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes that engagement clients, etc. I would say a range is between 2 and 4K per month. Interesting. And Radko, where can we find out more about you? Uh, about me personally, you can check out my LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, about the company, you can check out snipers.sale or zealagency.co.